Welcome to this session. We will have a package demo. Uh, Leo and Luis will present their package, and I won't bother, uh, won't take much of your time. So, Leo, please go ahead. Hey, right. thank you very much. Um, so, I want to speak loud because uh, we're using the microphone from my computer for people online. Um, so, we're not really using this one right now for the room. So, um, my name is Leonardo or Leo. Um, you prefer. And both Luis and me work at the Libre Institute for Brain Development, um, as long as Nick, uh, Rene, and Diana in the back. And we're going to be talking about this package that we made called Special LIBD. Um, so the LIBD acronym comes from where we work. Um, and this is where we have shared some of our recent uh, Bezium data sets. Um, so it's an experiment hub package on Bioconductor. Sorry, an experiment package on Bioconductor. Um, and but it also has a lot of software uh, functions to it and we keep expanding it and um, trying to add wrappers for things we do in different analysis so that's what we're going to talk about today you can download the slides on speakerdeck.com or you can also use the qr code for those for those slides over here so we'll tell you a little bit about how you can access data from special ibd um, a little bit about the spatial experiment structure that we are using uh, we are aware that uh, Lambda here in the audience has developed a special feature experiment. So this, there's different containers for this type of data that can be used. Um, and special IBD has a few different functions for visualizing uh, continuous or discrete variables. We'll show you a bit of those. Uh, have some functions for gene set infringement analysis, as well as tools for, for what we call uh, registration, spatial registration. Uh, you could also think about it as clustered registration. Um, now. Uh, we wanted to like live demo some code and things like that, but um, and the package is tested on GitHub Actions, Bioconductor, all these things. I ran some code here today and it doesn't work. Um, and uh, I'll need maybe Marcel's help later. It's about like the curl package from CRAN changed, um, and there's you know no errors have been reported elsewhere. But um, um, yeah, so we'll show you some. Um, websites where we have some of the output already pre-compiled and things like that, as well as uh, maybe some code that will be harder for you to run because it, it involves some files that I have on my laptop. Um, so a bit of background. Um, um, so for spatial transitomics, I think uh, a few of you were in the spatial transitomics session earlier today, but if those of you that were not there, the idea is that if you use Visium, which is a particular um, assay from the company 10x Genomics, you measure data on spots. There's around 5,000 spots on a 6.5 millimeter square area. Those spots um, uh, are arranged in a honeycomb pattern. And so you're able to measure gene expression values as well as generate images for that for a single tissue slide. And so you're almost doing like a bit of a mini bulk experiment because in each of those uh, spots, there are 55 micrometers, micrometers in diameter. Um, and you might have like three cells, six cells, depending on what um, tissue or organism you're studying and the cell density present there. Um, so that's why we can get. Um, and these plots over here, they were made with special IBD. Um, tweaked a little bit with, uh, with uh, maybe some illustrator here or there. Um, recently, earlier this year, we posted a preprint that we call special DLPFC. DLPFC stands for dors dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, it's our largest spatial data set. Uh, 30 Visium samples from uh, 10 different donors where we got anterior, middle, and posterior uh, DLPFC. The, these tiny squares kind of represent like the area that we're getting. It's these tiny, tiny sections because the brain is too big. Um, and this was work led by Luis, Abby, and Nick, and many other people. So that's one of our recent data sets highlighted here in red. Um, and the fetch data function from Spatial IBD, initially this whole package was developed around our pilot data. Um, and um, back then, Spatial Experiment didn't exist. So we had a hacked version of single cell experiment where we use the metadata slot um, some of you might have heard about that. A lot of people don't normally use it much, but that's where we put the images. We made all these kind of weird things. Now with spatial experiment, it's a lot more standardized. Um, and so this is where we can share um, the data for a few different projects. Recently, the spatial DLPC is also the Visium SPG Alzheimer's disease project. Um, 
And we share both like the full uh, spatial object as well as um, pseudobulk data um, that we make, some modeling results um, that contain the differential expressions, things like that, which are uh, some of the things we can use for the gene set enrichment. Now, um, spatial experiment, if you're not familiar with it, was developed by um, members of the bioconductor community uh, led by Dario, Lucas, and Helena. Um, everyone had access to Visium data sets and they were like, hey, we wanna develop early on a common container such that users will have ideally an easier time uh, because then they can hopefully have just their data in one object and don't need to uh, recast this data across multiple objects for different analysis. And it's really, it, it ended up being really a single cell experiment, which is shown here in gray, with the images added to it, as well as a few tables, one of them called the image data table, that contains some information about how you can plot um, or map each spot back to a particular pixel of your image, um, as well as the spatial coordinates, which has a bit more of a loose structure. Um, such that you can handle like Murphy's data and other types of um, spatial transitomics uh, methods. Uh, but really in the case of Visium, you can think of it as just an expansion of the cold data. Um, so um, uh, using that type of object, we can then use functions for in the spatial IBD. We have, um, they, they all start with this vis um, prefix for visualization. And we have gene, vis gene, which is where we plot continuous variables, and then this class, which is where we plot um, discrete variables like clusters. Um, both functions have very similar parameters, um, and um, we'll show you some of them next. Um, another thing we can do with a special IBD is, um, let's say we found, in our case for our pilot data set, we had seven layers of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex shown here on, on the um, rows. Um, so layer one to six with plus white matter. Uh, and so we found differentially expressed genes marking each of these layers. Um, but then we also had a um, list of genes that other people had found interesting. For example, genes that had been found to be differentially expressed uh, or uh, from a TWA study. Um, and so different genes that you have. Um, and so for each of those genes, sets, we can ask if they significantly overlap. And so basically we're doing a Fisher's um, enrichment test. If they, uh, if they overlap significantly any of the marker genes for the layers. And so there's a light, nice little like uh, function for doing this. And we got a bit cute uh, when we first made this because the different layers of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex have different widths. And so we use this um, uh, package, um, which I think is uh, based, built on top of Lattice. Um, Lattice was actually the first visualization package I learned in 2008 at a bioconductor conference. People maybe here don't use it as much anymore, um, uh, but it was a nice cluster package for, for that could allow you to have different widths of things. Uh, nowadays, we're thinking of moving to complex heat map that doesn't actually have that feature, uh, and you don't necessarily want to plot things in, in by the layer thickness, right? Um, but that's something we did uh, for that paper. Um, and the function is implemented in spatial IBD. So for a later live code, um, I'll show you the documentation website. Uh, so you can either you go to the bioconductor.org documentation website, or we also have a package down version. So that's the one I'll be using um, over here which um, um, I like a little bit because uh, a little bit more than the bioconductor version because you can, uh, if, you're look, if you're reading the vignette, if you see any function name, you can click on it and it'll, um, go, uh, it will automatically go to the reference page uh, for that function. And so um, if you're not familiar with a package down website, um, it shows a readme here in the front if you click on get started, that will be the main vignette. But if you click on the articles, there's a few more vignettes that you might have. If you click on the reference, you'll find each of the functions um, uh, in alphabetical order. Um, and if we click, for example, here on G that said enrichment plot, not only does it show the function definition, 
shows a bit the arguments as well as some examples that might have been run with the output of it. So um, there's one particular function that I first wanted to demonstrate, which is the run app function for making a shiny application with special IBD. This was the very first part of the package that was implemented. And that's because when we first generated some data, we needed to manually label spots. So that was the purpose of this function. It has been expanded now. Um, and so if we go to the examples, um, you actually have to have enough RAM for, for some of these examples. Um, um, but um, here we're gonna download that special VLPFC Visium data set. Um, which is an, um, an a special experiment object. We're also gonna download the pseudobulk object as well as the modeling results. So we download all of that. We're basically ready to make the uh, Shiny app. Now the full code here shows how you can make all the other custom documentation files. So we have some custom readme files, et cetera, that like give a flavor to the app. Um, so if you wanna download all those files, you can do that. Um, right now, um, for some reasons here, I'm running into this HTT, HTTP error version two. Um, so I'm gonna use the files that I have already on my computer. It's gonna load special IBD. This is actually the, the R script that we use for deploying things on, on Shiny apps. I'm gonna change the working directory to my source file because that's what um, Shiny apps expects. Um, well, the polychrome package. Um, and so in this case, I'm loading a specific files that I already have on the computer. We subsetted it to make it small enough for um, uh, Shiny apps. If you're not familiar with that, Shiny apps uh, only allows you to have up to eight gigabytes of RAM if you're paying for your Shiny apps account, uh, which is plenty for basically everything we do. But um, uh, in some occasions, you, you might want to actually pay, for example, Amazon uh, to have your um, app deployed there. So I want to load the modeling results. Um, um, just fix a variable there. I'm going to extract all the variables, um, set some colors. Then I can use the run app function where I'm going to specify what's my special experiment object, what's my object for the pseudobulk data, the uh, differential expression results, with those objects I can extract, which is the list of significant genes. You can give it a title for your app. Then you can specify which are your discrete variables. So these are gonna be mostly like cluster variables. Um, it could also include manual annotation, um, which um, on the spatial uh, tracks earlier today, someone asked Nick, if you can upload your custom annotation, you can, um, and this variable will play a role in that. Um, you could also, um, specify your continuous variables. And here, I'm just, we have a few different variables. There's quite a bit of, few of them that start with Vista seg or layer or broad. So I'm just like wrapping all of those. Um, and then you can specify which is your uh, directory where you have all these uh, custom documentation files. Uh, what is your default cluster? So if I run all of that, I'm gonna open it in my browser. Um, Mm -hmm. So at this point, we have uh, reproduced locally the, um, the Shiny app that we have where we have a readme. Um, in this case, we uh, provided the specific figure one for our paper with like the caption for it. Um, let me make it a little bigger. Um, then we have under the spot level data, this is where we have all of the data from that spatial experiment object. Layer level data is, a, um, is where we have the information after pseudo bulking. Uh, so it's a lot less, um, has less features because we're not trying to compete with like, for example, the IC package, the interactive summarized exploratory package. Um, so it only has some features that we want specifically for our applications. If we go to spot level data, for example, we go to cluster static. This is where we can make plots for those discrete variables. So by default here, we have the base base cluster results. Um, but let's, for example, play around with things. We go to the interactive tab. Um, this is gonna show like four tabs with like one continuous variable on the left. 
one discrete variable on the right. On the top row, we have everything spatial. On the bottom row, we have some reduced dimensions, in this case, the UMAP. Um, and so I'm gonna go and select some spots. Um, so I don't know, let's say for some reason these spots caught my attention. I'm gonna give it a name um, and I'm gonna label those spots. Once I've labeled them, if I go back to cluster static, now I'm gonna choose to plot the manual annotation variable. Um, and then there we go. We have the spots that I labeled as bias C2023. So this is what like uh, Kristen Maynard from my our um, biology uh, biological expert colleague used for manually annotating spots, and that's what you know led to actually creating this app to begin with. We then added more features where like, for example, we go to plot uh, sorry um, um, a particular gene. Um, um, I, um, we can then plot. Um, some variables that we have under the call data that we pre-specified when we ran the app, that these are the discrete variable, the continuous variables. Um, so you can choose whichever, whichever of those, or you can choose actual genes to plot. Um, we've now, with uh, Luis, we've added this, and Luis and Nick, we've added this feature where it like automatically crops the image. Because um, you can have samples like this, where the image is not really centered around the judicial frame. So we we use them information specific to Visium to automatically crop it uh, so it looks a little bit better. Um, and there's a lot of other features um, that this app provides. Um, um, I'll skip some of them, but we go to the layer level data. This is where we have some box plots for the differential expression results. So, um, I don't know, let's say you have a gene of interest. MOBP is one that a few people showed on their slides earlier today. Um, um, and so we can ask if it's differentially expressed in this case between like domain one and other domains. Um, um, on the gene set enrichment side, this is where you can upload your list of genes that you have of interest and ask if they are significantly enriched with the marker layers for marker genes for the different uh, domains that you have. Um, so that's the basics of, of, the, um, of the Shiny app. There's, there's more things related to it. Um, so um, the next thing is, um, um, so for, for that example here, we actually had to use a fetch data with special DLPFC Visium. That's how you, we can download that data. Now let's say you actually want to reproduce some plots um, locally. At that point, you will use the visgene function. Um, so let's say you have your special experiment object. Um, uh, here we will be downloading the, uh, the name here wasn't very specific because we, I guess, weren't planning and expanding the package when we first made it with the first pilot data set, but that's from our pilot data. Um, so let's say you want to uh, uh, plot a particular gene. By default, this gene is gonna use the very first gene that it has. Um, and then you just need to specify what sample you're going to plot and whether you want some um, color scales or not. Um, so if we see the examples over here, um, I guess I chose a gene that wasn't super interesting first, but later on we can choose, for example, to plot the uh, chromosome M ratio uh, information. Um, so they're fairly um, simple functions to, to, to use. One particular thing to keep in mind is that the size of the points is not proportional to the size of the actual spot on Visium. Um, it's actually an argument on the function called the, the, it's the point size. So um, uh, you can make it bigger or smaller. The center is actually the center of the Visium spot, um, but it's not proportional in size. So uh, this allows you to control and like sometimes you can do some nice, um, if you want, you want, if you want your plots to be a little bit overplotted, you can make the point size a little bit bigger. So that makes the transition across spots a little bit smoother. Or if you want to see the individual spots, you can make it smaller, um, uh, depending on what actual plot you want to see in the end. Um, there's some features here. For example, you want to specify a minimum um, of um, of uh, of uh, value for 
um, that has to be present on your counts before you actually plot things. Um, and so at that point, um, the NA spots become these like uh, light gray spots. Um, so that can be one way you want to like filter and see, look for specific genes at a high value. Um, similarly to this gene, we have the, this uh, uh, class function where um, you specify the sample ID and then your cluster variable. Um, clusters are always going to be related to colors. Um, so um, we go back to over here to the, uh, to the actual Shiny app. I gave up on, on, on colors in a way. And then I said, like, OK, just choose whatever uh, color scale you like. Right, so this is powered by the Palatier package. And so I don't know. Uh, uh, there's some I guess from the color blindness package. Um, the list is supposed to be filtered automatically such that um, only options that support the number of different cluster values that you have show up. Um, so you have a lot of clusters that will you know, lead you to having fewer options for choosing what to plot on. Um, so, I mean, this particular color scale has a very, like, uh, dark blue-greenish and for one color, and the other one is uh, black. So it wasn't the most entertaining, but um, um, I don't know, uh, polychrome is one that we use a lot, the polychrome. That's the default one. Um, so uh, with... Uh, on the uh, on the function side of things, um, this is where you can specify your colors, and it's probably the part that will need the most amount of customization. You can decide not to plot the background image by sending the spatial argument to false, um, and then here's where you can set the point size if you want to auto crop the image or not, things like that. Um, and so there's a few examples here where like. Uh, we can reproduce some of the uh, information shown on the logo. Um, 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 and like here, for example, we remove the, the, the H&E image from the background. Uh, so uh, this is how like the special IBD Shiny app makes uh, those plots that you saw. Um, and of course, if you don't want to learn about um, the R code for plotting, you can just use the Shiny app and then download over here the PDF versions if you if you want to. And so this is actually how like some of our collaborators have generated some supplementary figures for our papers by just using our the, the Shiny apps. Um, cool. Um, so then the gene set enrichment plots. Um, there's two functions. First, you have to have your input list of genes. Uh, it basically have a list uh, where each element of your list is a character vector with symbol IDs of the genes that you found um, to be of interest from the literature, et cetera. And then you just, we have our list of differential expressions. By default, that will be the ones from our pilot paper, but you can specify any other ones. Um, um, and so once you have that, that will create a little table um, that basically ran the feature test, where now you have the odds ratio, the p-value, uh, what cluster you belong to, uh, some information about what was the number of significant genes or the set size. And so this basic data frame is what is then used by the, um, um, we go to the see also section, we can find the link to the gene set enrichment plot. And so that's the, the input then for this function over here. There's a few thresholds where you can say, like, I only want to show the actual numbers. If the p-value threshold is like 12 or larger on the minus log 10 scale, uh, or uh, for the odds ratio cutoff. Um, so that's how you can control um, what is actually shown here, because we show here in black the odd ratios, but they have the odd ratio has to be higher than whatever was the the um, the p-value threshold for it. Um, so that's why you don't see numbers in every, in every cell. Um, so it's a very really simple function at this point, um, but um, it makes these nice little heat maps and you can change the colors again. Um, cool. 
So if you have any questions, please let me know about this part because I'm gonna we're gonna transition to Luis next. Um, so for people online, the question was, does this only work for Visium data uh, or maybe other spatial transcriptomic uh, methods? And so a spatial experiment works for many types of uh, spatial transcriptomics methods. The spatial IBD, which is the one we're demonstrating, was really only developed for Visium because that's the type of data that we had. Um, we haven't really tried to expand it to other data types. Um, in theory, a lot of these things could work uh, because we're really plotting things just from the spatial experiment object. But in terms of memory um, and things like that, we'll, we'll see, especially on the shiny app side when you're running the, the, the apps under an eight gigabyte limit, right? Um, cool. Can you run the shiny app locally so you don't have So the question is, can you run the shiny app locally? That's what I just did here. Yeah. All right, um, but we also have them on, on Chinese apps. Um, cool. So that, that one function of enough RAM is it in is it in your code or? So the 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 question is the function enough RAM is it part of your package or not? Um, and so that function enough RAM um, um, is on the package, but it's actually a very simple function that. Um, it's really useful, though. That's why I want to Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So um, basically, what it runs is this other uh, function, get RAM from the bench, benchmark ME package. Uh, so that tells you how much RAM you have uh, available. And then enough RAM just says, like, is that value less than or bigger than the, the input value that you provided to enough RAM. So it's a little wrapper function for that other function. So speaking of RAM, so um, if you have like a very so if you don't have enough RAM, so they have like a very big example there that's with like a delayed array. So the question is uh, for RAM, do we have examples with delayed array uh, instead of um, fully resolved matrices or let's say the matrices with the capital M package matrix. Um, um, and so the single cell data we, pro we provided is actually with the layer array. Um, um, and but for the spatial data sets, we've only used the, um, I forget is, if it's DG, DGC or DGT matrix uh, function. Um, containers from the matrix package, capital M matrix package. Um, now, something that also takes quite a bit of RAM is the images themselves. Um, the images are stored as matrices uh, of where, like, let's say you have a 600 by 700 uh, pixel image. Um, so uh, if you have that image, but then you have it for all of your samples, in our case, let's say 30 samples, uh, that adds up. Um, and so a lot of times when we deploy apps on Shiny apps, we, we remove the high resolution images. High resolution is the name that 10X Genomics provide to images that have at most 2,000 pixels on either X or Y. They're not really high resolution. Um, and so you don't actually notice things on a monitor or stuff when plotting. So we normally plot things with the 600 pixel versions. Uh, and the 2,000 pixel versions occupy a few gigs of RAM when you have quite a few images. Um, the spatial experiment itself, the package for the container has an option of uh, storing URL links to images, uh, where at that point the um, image is not stored on the object, but is downloaded on demand. Um, but if you run into issues like today, where like uh, for some reason things are not working with the web, then you, you can't make the plots. Cool. All right. So. What's it here? All right, cool. screen. Oh. Okay, great. Um, we're gonna move on to, I guess, like the less shiny part of this and the more, um, I guess, tools you maybe use locally. Um, one is this function registration wrapper. So this helps us calculate um, 
basically like look for marker genes in three different ways. So there's a uh, one versus all, or I guess there's one versus all or enrichment, which is what we primarily use. There's an ANOVA test and there's a pairwise test. So basically this is gonna test for suitable gear data across your clusters that you specify. And then it's going to um, look for marker genes using those three different methods and store all of those. Um, perhaps we look at the, I'm gonna look at the um, reference for that. So um, the, we actually provide like a whole family of functions that um, follow the registration um, package, or I guess like this registration protocol, um, but we've kind of wrapped it all up into this registration wrapper function. Um, so this takes either your SCE, basically it can use an SCE object or a, or a single cell experiment or a spatial experiment package. It's flexible across those. And it takes two different key um, metrics, which is gonna be your variable of registration. So for instance, what you're interested in finding marker genes for, uh, a common example for our spatial experiment is going to be like those clusters that we define or an anatomical region that maybe you've annotated into your data. Um, and then also your sample ID, um, if, uh, if you have multiple samples. Um, and then it's going to, um, you can also give it some other like covariates that you'd be interested in controlling for in a differential expression, such as sex and age, other covariates like that. Um, and then you can also give it your column names for your ensemble ID and your gene names out of your row data. And that just helps you make like a nice table with all of the uh, gene information that you might want to add. Um, so this produces like a nice, uh, it produces a list of those three different types of uh, marker gene data. So your enrichment, your ANOVA, and your pairwise data. Um, and so this function kind of stores it all. And this also has a option to save out your pseudobulk data as often these objects are large and that's like the most computationally intensive portion of this process. So then you can also have that pseudobulk data on hand and ready to plot later. Um, how much time do we have? Uh, we have 15 whole minutes? Okay. Um, so. You're on to 245. Okay. Okay, we'll leave time for questions. Um, so, uh, so that's like some of the, that's how we calculated the um, gene enrichment data that Leo demoed that you can then plot and make um, plots like this on our Shiny apps. Um, and also to find genes of interest within these clusters that you've defined. Um, so that's very uh, useful for all of that. Um, and once again, registration wrapper kind of makes that all like one clean step for you. Um, and a main reason that you might want to, how do you make this full screen? Um, so a primary use we have for that function is to perform um, a process that we call spatial registration. So this helps us compare and contrast different sets together. So one, example that we use this for is that we had our um, first DLPFC data set um, where we had our manual layers annotated by um, Kristen, uh, Kristen Maynard, like Leo mentioned earlier, using our space shiny package. And once we had all these wonderful annotations and these marker genes defined across these like known layers, um, we wanted to know in our new data set, which is our spatial DLPFC, spatial DLPFC data, where we had base space clusters, hey, which of these base space clusters match up back to these layers? That's like something we're very interested in. So we kind of had like a reference data set and then we had like a query data set. So what we did is we had performed the uh, regis uh, spatial registration, I guess the, um, we found like the, um, all the modeling results using registration wrapper on both functions. And then we used the spatial registration process to compare our query to our reference and what this does is then for each pair, so for instance, comparing this green cluster to this white matter cluster, it takes um, the T statistics of those enrichment analyses and it compares them. And then from there, we get a correlation. And then from there, we can plot all of these pairwise correlations between our reference data set, so our layers in white matter, and then our query data set with our new uh, clusters. Um, so these are our like spatial, our, new base space clusters, and we're able to find where these match up. We we'll produce these spatial registration plots, which are these um, purple and green heat maps, where the green pairs are where we're finding like significant correlation, or, like strong correlation between the um, manually annotated layers and the base space annotations. So you're able to do that and kind of answer like cool questions. 
So you're also able to do this process across, um, for instance, single cell, uh, single cell data. If you wanted to compare single cell data to a spatial registration, to a spatial data set, you're able to do that. You're able to also compare single cell to single cell and just kind of find where um, differentially expressed genes uh, correlate well between groups. So this is kind of like a spatial example of this and we call it spatial registration, but there's a wide variety of use cases of this process. So um, I'm just gonna go through this code. There's a whole vignette of, for this on our spatial LABD website that kind of like goes into depth about what I've just talked about more, but we'll just look at the end code at the end here. Um, um, so yeah. Um, yeah, so the first step here is that we wanna run our registration wrapper um, function on our query data set. So here I'm actually showing an example for a single cell experiment object um, from Fatran. Uh, so I have this data set downloaded and I'm providing cell type as the cluster I'm interested in. And then uh, donor is actually our sample ID here. Um, so this finds our marker genes um, modeled for the enrichment. I extract the t-statistics here. So I have a table that is just our t-statistics across our different cell types. And then basically this is the key function that performs kind of like that layer stack correlation. So I give it the statistics that I've just generated with the enrichment statistic. And then I also provide it the layer modeling results from our um, reference. So this was the layer modeling results from that reference um, annotated layer data set that we have available to download both um, from the uh, Lever <laughs> spatial LABD package, or perhaps this is like a reference data set that you've calculated the enrichment stats yourself. So you're able to do that. And then we're specifying that we want to compare it against the enrichment statistics. And we also like to use just the top 100 marker genes. Um, we find that this produces cleaner results. We've also found that that's kind of stable whether or not we use that, but um, we use top 100 typically. And what it produces is this table of correlations between our reference, which is our columns here. So our white matter and there are six layers. And then for the rows, which are the different groups that we provided in our query data set. So here it's our different cell type groups. So that outputs in color. You can kind of already see where things start to match up. Um, but to explore those results more thoroughly, we can use our layer stack correlation plots that give us that purple, that take that input and gives us that purple and blue green um, heat map. So we can see like where these different groups match up the nicest and have the strongest correlation. So here we can see that our oligo group has strong correlation with the genes that are also enriched in our white matter. And you can kind of infer different relationships between these clusters using that process. Um, yeah, and then we also provide another function which is annotator registered clusters. So using this, if you believe you have strong correlations and you're interested in annotating your query groups based on your reference, like for instance, layers in this point, um, an example that we provide and also a process that we did in the spatial DLP PFC paper is we wanted to annotate our excitatory neuron clusters to their different layers because we know the excitatory neurons are layer specific. So what we did is um, use our annotated, annotate registered clusters what that does is it finds your strongest annotation in this pairwise matchup and it asks, is it over this um, confidence threshold that you set? And then also, is there another one that's close? That's a confident, confidence merge ratio. And what it does is it basically, using those two parameters, iterates through all your matches and finds where things match up well. So for instance, you could say that oligos strongly associated with your white matter and we have good confidence. Um, and maybe an example for the excitatory neurons would have been, uh, excitatory C matches up very strongly with layer three. So maybe we could annotate that layer as a layer three excitatory neuron. So you can provide more anatomical context to your different groups in your query using this process. So we find this to be very useful and we've used it to annotate both relating our new um, novel spatial domains back to like, uh, I guess like understood, I guess like the histological layers, but we also annotated cell types to both our new spatial domains and our old layers. So it's a very useful process that can add a lot of context um, between your different data sets. Um, yeah, so those are functions that are kind of 
outside this, the, the shiny app realm. Um, cool. Yeah. So yeah. So um, you want there's a detailed guide to all of that and like reproducing that code um, included as one of the vignettes on our re on our website. Um, there's also going to be a tutorial video up at some point on a, um, for our team. So I think that was everything we wanted to demo today. Yeah, it's also available on Black Conductor, but you have to use the develop branch of Black yeah. Conductor. You want to see the, the new vignette there. Uh, or it'll be available publicly around October. October. Yeah, on the release page. Uh, on, the, on the reproducibility uh, link there, any information on, on that link? Wait. In the shiny app, or in the uh, oh, the, oh, there was a. There I don't know. Right. So, uh, I'm repeating the question for people on the okay. line. So, the question was uh, about the shiny app, uh, the reproducibility information link. So, um, uh, is it this one? The help desk. It was on the right hand side uh, on the main. Uh, when you had a plot that over on the right hand side there at the bottom said reproducibility. Um okay, I think it's on the vignette right here. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this is the reproducibility section of the vignette, which shows um the R session information that was used for making for running the code in this vignette. Um and so we like to use the session info package, um, which provides not only the information about what version of R we were using, uh where like Pandoc, for example, was installed, what version of Pandoc, but then also like um, all the versions of the packages, where they were installed from, if they were installed from Bioconductor, um, the RStudio package manager, uh, or some, if you had packages installed directly from GitHub, it would also show that. Um, so it's a very nice package that expands the base R functional uh, called session info. That the base R function is session with info capital I. And then this other one is uh, lowercase without any spaces session info package. And the function is session underscore info all on lowercase. So it's a tidyverse <laughs> function. I mean, session info is a package from the tidyverse world. Right. So this would be great if, if, if we had like a R notebook or R markdown. Um, um, so for kind of like automation. What do you think about that one? So the question is about automation and whether it would make sense to have an art markdown file for automation. Um, so um, this is all generated from markdown, right? Yeah. Is that the answer to the question? Yeah. So this the, an R package is uh, how it's made is uh, um, Ellis Patrick Patrick Ellis. Uh, is, uh, from the audience is saying that um, our packages in general have their uh, documentation, these vignettes, store as our markdown files. Um, so that's why they, uh, you can run this on different computers, you'll probably get the same result, uh, or that's the, in the intention. In terms of, um, let's say you, you were generated a bunch of Visium data sets, and all of them you wanted to uh, especially register against the same target data set, I think at that point you could write some a little pipeline um, to do that uh, to run these functions all the time. You generate new data sets, um, but we are not generating that many data sets, so we always analyze one at a time. I guess. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I just I was, I was looking at the you know one step further in the, having a instead of a shiny app, we had a an R markdown doc that ran once in a while on a data set for you. All the reasons. If you had input data, it would yeah. just plug it all up for you right there. Yeah, so uh, the question is like, what if you had just an R markdown file that you ran once in a while once you generate new data? And so uh, there's features, for example, from the R Studio Cloud where you can have an R markdown file that is dynamic and runs every, let's say, every week. The, the typical example they have there is using information from the stock market where you want to generate a report for a particular stock market. ID variable every day or whatever. Um, so if you were generating that amount of data, you could set up an R markdown file like that where you say like pull data from this particular directory on your server and, and generate a report 
um, but um, uh, we're not at that scale yet ourselves. Well, I was just looking because, because I, I deal with a lot of shiny apps and a lot of arm work now. Uh, people don't want to have to go through this and click all the shiny app stuff, so we just put an input data, uh, inputs, and then just say go. Mm -hmm. It generates report form without having to do the, they, they don't have yeah. to, They don't have to drive the shiny app. Yeah, so then um, the question was about like, um, or I mean the comment really was about describing a situation where um, people don't necessarily want to reproduce all your plots through a Shiny app. Uh, it's easier to just do it on an R markdown file. And yeah, we, we um, that's definitely possible to do. Mm -hmm. Cool. Wait, we've got our acknowledgments. Yeah. Can I ask one really dumb question? So your code for initiating the shiny app, you had a ton of information there saying what's your categorical, what's your numerical, those kinds of things. By default, can I just run it in my spatial experiment and it'll guess all of those things or do I need to smash it out? So the question was um, the code I ran for the shiny app um, here. Um, specified a bunch of code for what are the discrete variables, uh, which are the continuous variables. Um, and so the question is like, can the run app function guess for you which are those variables? Uh, it's not implemented to guess for you. However, we do have, um, let's say you, you ran a space ranger. Um, 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 mm -hmm. The Space Ranger is from 10x Genomics, um, um, and will it will run um, a dimension reduction for you. It uh, will uh, run k-means clustering from k2 up until k10. It will run a graph-based clustering method. Uh, it does it one sample at a time, produces all these results. So we do have a function here called read 10 x Visium wrapper. There's a read 10 x Visium function from Spatial Experiment. This, one, this function from Spatial LBD does that, but also adds all in all of those results from, um, from Space Ranger. And so you can run read 10 x uh, wrapper from um, uh, a, a fresh uh, Space Ranger output and then run the run app function. And then those defaults actually are compatible. But if you have more variables that you generate elsewhere, uh, you will need to specify which are your discrete or continuous variables. Um, yeah. And the, the issue there is that uh, it's hard to guess sometimes with um, integer variables that don't have a lot of different options. Because you could say like, oh, if a variable has more than 10 options, at that point it's numeric, right? Uh, but you could have an integer variable that only has uh, five unique values, right? Uh, so um, that's why like um, we didn't get into the guessing game. Yeah. But I'm sure there might be some package out there that, that does that, and we could maybe just use that for guessing. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much for, for being here. And, yeah, congrats, Liz. Thank you. Yeah. All right.